History, as a subject of study, is more than a linear progression of events. It's ideas, currents of thought, institutions of learning, social movements, moral awakenings, and more. In a brief new book, today's guest traces the history of ideas that shaped the United States from its beginning. She's Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen, this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, scholars, journalists, and more to make sense of the stories that shape public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Dr. Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen, the Merle Curdy and Vilas Borghese Distinguished Achievement Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's also the author of an important new book, The Ideas That Made America. Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's so, a great pleasure to be here. We want to talk uh, about your book, but I think almost more foundationally, I want to ask you, what is intellectual history? Oh, you had to ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, intellectual history is a, a way of studying history, but instead of studying the big politicians or the big... Uh, you know, political events or wars, not that those are not relevant, but it looks at the past by way of ideas and by way of people who make them or are moved by them. So it's fundamentally a historical enterprise, but it's really interested in looking at things like intellectual movements or certain key ideas or even key texts, um, famous thinkers. Um, but it can also have uh, more humble aspirations, which is to look at how average Americans simply understood themselves and understood their America. What, of, of all the history that you could study, what drew you to this as a field? Well, it was the ideas. Um, so I um, was a 19-year-old undergrad who sort of backed my way into a, uh, an intellectual history course. Um, really almost by accident. It was probably just that it fit into it my fit schedule. schedule. You know, like, who, who knows? Um, and I'd never, I'd never even heard of such a thing, intellectual history. But what I was introduced to were literary critics, um, philosophers, scientists, uh, artists. And that th those ideas, those figures were windows onto a particular moment. And in that case, it was an American intellectual history class. Those were windows onto the American past. So I learned about the Progressive Era. I learned about the Harlem Renaissance. I learned about the New Deal. But it wasn't necessarily by way of the big political structures or the economic context, but by way of the ideas um, that were either expressive of certain commitments of the time or ideas that went on to be influential in shaping the, the course of American history. And it was, uh, um, I use the word feral, like, you know, like I, I took the course and it's like I became intellectually feral because uh, in a good way, I think, I hope, because it was so intoxicating to come into contact with people for, who I had no idea who they were or I had heard the names, right? But it was just a name. I didn't have any concept. And it was like, I mean, for my 19-year-old self and now for my much older self, the idea that you could have a conversation across time and space with these people was just so powerful uh, for me and so moving that... Well if you had not been a historian, what do you think? What, were, you, were you already a history major when you took that no, course? Or how, no, no, I no. Mean, this I was, was life changing. Yeah, it was life changing. Um, uh, I, I wish I could say that some of my students would, would say the same thing and in a positive way. I'm not so <laughs> sure, but I'll, I'm working on it. Yeah, it was life. I mean, like, like um, life altering feels yeah. more. I mean, it was seismic um, because I had no, even no sense of myself as an intellectual either. I mean, that was not, it would never have been a term of self-description. I still use it tentatively now, <laughs> you know, at <laughs> risk of embarrassing myself or other professional thinkers. Um, but the, it was really intoxicating to come into contact with some of these works, some great, some not so great. 
but it was like a portal into someone else's mind. And in some time cases, they were say something that was so utterly offensive to me, but then it helped me thrash out what I thought, you know? And sometimes it articulated something in me, but as yet not articulated. And I was so grateful for that contact. So, um, I mean, I tell this story, but it, it's, it, 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 to talk about stories in the public, I mean, this one is very, very true, that because of the course, I, in those days we had card catalogs, I remember, I mean, as if it's yesterday, running down to our library at, at the university that I was at and looking up American intellectual history, and the call number was E169.1, still is, and then, you know, looking through those cards and then going, running down to the stacks, Into to the that stacks, section, yeah. And just setting up residence there, uh, more or less for the last three decades. So, yeah, I mean, that's a profound experience. Have you ever had an epiphany or an apocalypse or whatever the word is? Apocalypse. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. not the right word. But you know, a moment like that. I mean, this this was truly a defining moment. Yeah. This doesn't yeah. happen to everyone all the time, and sometimes no, it never I'm, happens. And I'm so any. grateful for it. I mean, have you ever had anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, not, uh, um, I'm sure my husband would like me to say, you know, when I met him, <laughs> uh, my daughter and son would say when I gave birth to them. So, uh, uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of them in there. But I mean, in terms of those, those moment of, of self reckoning or, um, yeah. I would say probably a couple of other times along my intellectual path as I discovered an idea that I wanted to pursue or an idea that was kind of rattling around but not yet sorted out, like something clicks into place, that can be very, very powerful um, and energizing. Um, uh, but in terms of, you know, kind of life course, that's it. Um, it was the encounter with American intellectual history. So in writing the ideas that made America, obviously there are a whole lot of ideas, hundreds, thousands, going back over a long history. How did you decide which ones to include in your book and therefore which ones, many more, not to include? Well, well particularly yeah. because it's a concise history. Yeah. This is, this yeah. is not yeah. It's not 800 a, pages. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think the idea for this actually came originally from my editor at Oxford University Press, where they can see that there is a real appetite now for these you know, shorter volumes that give people you know, a larger sweep of something, but can actually be done in our busy, you know, busy day and age. And so there hasn't been, I mean, it's been decades since there's been anything like a sweep of American intellectual history. And so the vision was, it's time now. We need another one, but we also need one that fits into our world of then 2019, now 2000, or, or 20, um, you know, 2020. And so and then I foolishly thought, oh, it's brief. <laughs> that should be easier. <laughs> and no one told me <laughs> how stupid I was <laughs> to think that. So I sort of foolishly um, imagined like, I mean, I'm only, I'm sort of kidding, but I actually saw the constraints of the brevity as perhaps liberating, knowing that I couldn't possibly tell every story. I could not possibly introduce every thinker. I could not possibly do an exegesis on every major text. It would force me to resort to what I call, I hopefully not pretentiously, voice and vision, which is my voice, um, as that's going to carry it through, and a certain vision of the key themes or the key light motifs, and I'll get as much as I can. I'll bring as many thinkers to the mic as I possibly can, without crowding, you know, the the crowding the pages and without exhausting my reader. So it was both a source of tremendous turmoil, and <laughs> you know, I mean, just cries when I had to cut something that I just thought this is disqualifying, someone should take away my PhD. And other times when I was grateful and I just said, you know, may this serve as an introduction to this history. One volume, even if it was 800 pages, couldn't cover the ground. But if it can do something to activate people's um, excitement about American history by way of ideas, if it could introduce them to thinkers who they read long ago but haven't been, you know, haven't been reminded of, or be introduced to someone new who they didn't even know was possible, then, you know, my thought was it, it did its job. One of the things, as you mentioned, that it's been decades since there's been this sort of concise history of American intellectual history. One of the things that struck me about your book is it's inclusive. 
So you begin with a really sort of a, a, a I thought a, a very interesting reflection on the lack of understanding about the pre-Columbian yeah. intellectual history. Yeah. Uh, and then it, throughout the, the volume, you discuss underrepresented populations, mm -hmm. female voices, African-American voices, slave voices. How is that different from the last time somebody tried to publish on, this, on, on, on American intellectual history? Um, I think the key word here is different. I mean, um, uh, the last, I mean, there are some beautiful surveys. One of them was written um, in the late 40s, and it was a Pulitzer Prize winning book called The Growth of American Thought, written by Merle Curdy, who was a professor of American intellectual Whose history. Chair at, you have at, exactly. Now. Yeah. Um, so I recommend for anyone. I mean, in many ways, it's very, very dated, but it's also beautiful and timeless. And that was, you know, bi again, a big sweeping. Um, and you know, he was someone who tried to be attentive to underrepresented voices, but it was it just wasn't the demands of his moment, or at least not as he conceptualized it. I mean, it's funny to think about story in the public square. I think the reason why it was it's been so many decades since anyone tried was because we lost faith in the possibility that we could tell a story that was inclusive. You know, that we could tell a story of something like American thought that widened out beyond, you know, the founders and a few, you know, the great names that people, you know, people know, that that seemed too cacophonous, too multivocal, working in too many registers from professional intellectuals to, you know, rap artists, you know, whatever the case may be, how would you possibly tell that story? And so I think many of my colleagues rightly for years, you know, sort of backed off of the notion that you could tell a comprehensive narrative that could do that, which is the demands, it should have been the demands of our entire century. I mean, it should have been the demands of our long history, but certainly de the demands of our moment. And so um, that is what I set out to do, um, to find a balance between the names that are familiar and should be familiar. Um, so you know, Jonathan Edwards or Thomas Jefferson or Ra Ralph, Lund Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, you know, for whom I cannot imagine a writing a book pretty much on anything without Emerson, to be <laughs> honest. Um, but I mean, certainly not this. But then the names that are uh, perhaps lesser known or people not really, uh, not necessarily understood as formidable thinkers um, or just who don't, don't get enough airtime. And so some of that is lesser known biblical scholars in the 19th century who were involved with what was called biblical historicism, so a new scientific approach to the Bible. But this has a huge radiating effects on American intellectual life. But their names are, 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 are you know, in many cases lost, not lost to history, but certainly lost to um, popular consciousness, popular consciousness. Yeah. exactly. Um, trying to think about art as a venue where ideas are put out there. So Louise Milu Jones, an important African-American artist in the Harlem Renaissance, she communicated her ideas with, with paint, um, not with words, but the, the, her paintings make arguments and they made very particular arguments that were very crucial for the Harlem Renaissance. And so I also tried to be not only more expansive or ecumenical in terms of the kinds of figures that that I chose or, or, or represented, but also the kinds of sources as well. So texts are not the only ways in which ideas make their way in the world. Ideas make their way through other forms, you know, of visual culture. Um, they way, make their way also in the embodied, in the intellectual themselves, so the persona of the intellectual. They make their way in our built environment too. And so that was, a, I tried to use the book also as a way to alert people to the ways in which American ideas um, are around them all over the place in ways that you don't even think of, you know? Um, so, so that's something that I tried to do in the book. I want to take her class. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. one, of the rec one of the questions you tackle, it's a big question in your book and in your work is, what does it mean to be an American yeah. over time? And how has that question been answered? over time, and, and again, we would have to like take the master's level class to get that answer, but sort of succinctly, it, it clearly has changed by period, by community, yeah. by people. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, that's, I mean, where, Jim, I mean, your a, question that's is- That's a big question. It's what a big mean, question. What does it mean to be an American? So the, 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 what's important is that that is 
one of the key questions of American intellectual history or in American intellectual history. In other words, if, there, if you're trying to tell the grand narrative of American thought, it is a history of people asking this very question. What does it mean to be an American in a place where we, you know, with the exception of Native Americans, everybody's a hyphenate, you know, everybody has a backstory. Um, right from the inception, you know, right from the earliest colonies, there was very little that held these people together. They had different religious commitments. Uh, they had different tongues, um, different places, the origins, you know, from home. And so right from the start, America has been um, a plurality and of people trying to figure out who is our we, you know, who is my we here? And so that story is, that, that question just comes up again and again. It comes up in the 18th century as we have the expansion of, um, of the British Empire. Um, it comes up again in the American Revolution. Who, who is the we now as we think about ourselves oppositionally to England? After that, you have new waves of immigrants. You've got, um, you've got slaves. You've got indentured servants. So this question over and over has to, is asked over and over again. Um, and up until, you know, up until our own time. So it is, I think the key thing is that that is the question of American intellectual history. If, the, if you could say there is one, what does it mean to be an American? And then the story is, or the history there is to widen out and ask who's asking that question, why are they asking it then? How, what, in what ways are they blinkered in saying this is what it means to be an American and that's not what it means to be an American? So, you know, what are the conditions that lead to those answers? And then how do those answers translate into public policy, economic, you know, um, our um, economic policy, um, the built environment of our cities? You know, even, even something like that is an expression of who is our we. So is there a single answer to that question that we could all agree on um, today? Uh, what does it mean to be an American? Um, I'm afraid no. I, 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 or so I'm not aware of it. Um, I know that there are answers that I find very, very persuasive. There's answers that I like to share in my own writing and my own teaching. Give us one or two of those. Um, well, um, I can introduce you to a name of a thinker from, uh, who wrote in 1916. His name was Randolph Bourne, and I do feature him in the book. He was um, an, a young intellectual uh, who uh, wrote during uh, the... Uh, the years leading up to and during World War I. He dies in the influenza outbreak um, in, um, at the end of the war. But he was a young, a young guy from uh, New Jersey who went to Columbia. And when he goes to New York, it's like his world broke open. Talk about a transformative experience, seeing people, hearing different languages, seeing the incredible possibility of what was then called the American melting pot. But his thought was the melting pot doesn't even do justice to this, incredibly, this incredible symphony of human difference that we have in America. And what he did was to look and, you know, he's writing now during World War I, where what is that? That's belligerent nationalism. That's a kind of provincialism. You know, that's a chest thumping tribalism. And he says, why? So he was also un un unsurprisingly against American entry into World War I. Mm -hmm. And his point was, so the piece is called Transnational America. Um, it was published um, in 1916. You can Google it. You know, it's, on, it's online. And it's a beautiful, if you will, argument, but also love letter to American plur pluralism, um, that what it means to be an American is to be a hyphenate. Um, uh, to recognize that nobody has any claims to being an authentic American, unless, of course, you're indigenous. He makes this argument already in 1916. He does in yeah. Long. And that he, in his, his language, is that it bespeaks a poverty of imagination to not see this as what recommends America, what makes America great, uh, what makes America exceptional. And so that, that, that's a piece, I think, that tries to get on our radar screens, you know, or, and come trippingly to the tongue about how we might conceive what it means to be in America. This could be re required reading for, for well, 2020. Well, I will say, when I, I, this is, I've, I've been lucky enough to get some, some wonderful letters from readers of the book, and invariably they identify Bourne as someone who they never had heard of before. Yeah. And again, he was kind of an intellectual rock star in his day, but history's funny that way. He yeah. just kind of right. drops off this, the, the, the the radar screen. He becomes important in the 1960s again as young intellectual, radical intellectuals are trying to find their foremothers and forefathers and born 
kind of has a renaissance then. So, you know, he, he's not unknown to, to, to certainly not to scholars or political um, commentators, but he certainly doesn't have that wider reach. But this text should be a foundational text, I think. Absolutely. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of that answer. You know, so there is a... Um uh, maybe a zeitgeist. There's a spirit of our times right now that for the first time in my adult life there are people who are voicing skepticism about the endurability of the American Republic. Mm -hmm. Is that, are there antecedents for that in our 220, 240 year history? Uh, as a republic? Sure. Oh, sure. Um, so sometimes it's a rhetorical move. I mean, that's so that's the perhaps fun but also challenging part of intellectual history is trying to discern and parse when that's a rhetorical move, mm -hmm. right? And when it's earnest but maybe wrongheaded mm -hmm. and when they might have, you know, maybe they were right. So, for example, in the 1930s, of course, this is something that many commentators from the re right and the left are saying. I mean, this is not a... This doesn't track politically, but the kind of crisis of our republic with, amidst the specter of totalitarianism from fascism um, and Nazism in Europe. And um, some worried that FDR's New Deal was a sign that it was coming here, that it could happen here. Um, other, I know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Other, uh, or Sinclair Lewis. Um, Sinclair but Lewis, yeah. That, that's okay. um, or, and some thought, no, that that was going to be the way of saving democracy, for, you know, from that sort. But yeah, that was a, a move that was made then, and um, and I think not un unreasonably so because history could have gone another way, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, the crisis of the republic. I mean, the Civil War. I right. mean, that's that, that's that's another one, and that was real, <laughs> and they were right, um, and it was. And um, I'll leave it to another historian who you invite on to say why, you know, the North won the Civil War and how things worked out <laughs> afterwards. But um, so, but yeah, the, I mean, there, there have been many, many episodes in the past. Um, sometimes, again, not thinking maybe it's rhetorical or it was strongly felt by that person, but probably not paired out by reality. Mm -hmm. But I think we are in a moment like um, I'm not saying that we're heading into a civil war, but I think we're in a moment where it's more than rhetorical, mm -hmm. that it's an informed lament it's a, or an informed critique, uh, um, an informed cry, cry for help. So, um, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, sobering. So the, <clears throat> the impact of science on American history, thought, culture, and of course intellectual ideas has been profound. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is among your work too. Talk a little bit about that, and perhaps maybe starting with Darwin. Yeah. We see echoes even today of Darwin and the theory of evolution, and certainly historically there have been many. There's been famous trial, and talk about the impact of science. Okay. Well, um, so I'll focus on, on Darwin. Darwin, and yeah. what I love about Darwin is that is something that my students know, or at least they know of. Everyone has yeah. this idea, you know, 1859, origin of species comes and America breaks into two. You know, you've got religion, you know, pious people committed to the religious faith on one hand and the atheists or what then was becoming a fashionable term, agnosticism, agnostics. Mm -hmm. um, or actually I should say soon after Darwin, it becomes a, a coined as a term and for not many people, but a term of self-description, really responding to, to Darwin's challenge. But the Dar it didn't happen that way. I mean, and so that's a neat ex moment where, or example where we can say, people are very, very, very talented at ignoring ideas that challenge their own. <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, how true that is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, you know, just sort of duck and weave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there were many ways in which people just said, he's wrong, you know, this is, this is crazy, this is soft science, this is ungodly, and they just dodged it and it was no problem. Um, there were others, and I think this is where it gets more interesting, for whom Darwin really should have fundamentally altered their world, but instead what they did was to just rework Darwinian conceptions of evolution to support their own view. Um, and so where the, the folks who had the, a positive genius for this were mostly liberal Protestant ministers and theologians at the time who were able to rework Darwinism and see it as an endorsement of their faith rather than a challenge to their faith. 
And so anyway, it's just, I think Darwinism is interesting because it really, the ways in which um, it gets dodged, it gets reappropriated, it gets subdued. And I think the, in, the impact of Darwinism, that takes a while to uh, roll out and to you know, challenge um, make changes in American thought, but it's just, it's not one storyline. Um, so out of what, out of the Darwinian reception and giving additional credence to evolutionary theories, this is where we start to get um, kind of more authority for race sciences, which becomes the groundwork for eugenics. Mm. So, you know, there's a path in which science, um, I don't even know if I need the scare quotes. Authoritative science can be used for very regressive means, um, or science can be deployed in political ways um, that maybe is in consonant with, you know, with with its own, right. you know, commitments. Because this is not unique to America. No, no, no. no. This is not the, the human experience. Exactly. Over um, history and across the, the planet. But uh, there's a path from Darwinism to progressivism. Um, which basically says, well, Darwin shows that it's an ever-changing, ever-becoming universe. And so it means the democracy we have right now isn't fixed and final. The social relationships we have right now aren't fixed and final. The, what seem like intractable, intractable problems with our industrial capitalism. Yeah, you know, think about Jacob Rees and the pictures, you know, from the late 19th century of tenement houses. This, this, this chasm between the have and have-nots we now know from evolutionary theory, it doesn't have to be like this. We are in an ever dynamic universe. Um, so that th this get actually emboldens progressives to make what, you know, what would then be called progressive change to ameliorate problems rather than to be used as an apologia for them. Jennifer, that's a hugely important topic, but we're out of time. So thank you so much for being with us. She's Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen. The book is The Ideas That Made America. You want to check it out. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.